I want to start with a comment, though, from a leading barrister. He's called Francis Fitzgibbon QC. He's chairman of the Criminal Bar Association. And uh, he sent a note to criminal barristers earlier this week referring to something that happened last week. It was a test for people who want to become part-time judges. It was an exercise uh, set up by the Judicial Appointments Commission, which is the body uh, that uh, selects people for the judiciary. Um, and the idea was they had to complete a test online, and the system crashed. The whole thing was a disaster. Um, and uh, he is very critical of the Judicial Appointments Commission. Uh, he says they knew exactly how many people were going to take part because everybody had registered well in advance. Uh, the system couldn't cope. It was no way to treat lawyers who only wanted to serve the public by applying for a judicial post. Um, and he tried to draw some conclusions from this. Um, he said, uh, last week's fiasco, that's what it was, does not bode well for a mass rollout of real-time digital court hearings unless significantly more resources are put into them than was available for the test. And he finally said, I'm no Luddite, but my faith in technological answers to human problems has taken a bit of a knock this week. So that's our starting point, a great deal of concern about the idea of technology. Talking of which, uh, somebody said, what about a Twitter hashtag for this lecture? I haven't put this on the screen because uh, we only thought about it yesterday. But if you want to tweet, I think the hashtag to use is online courts as one term. Right, let's start here in Reading Crown Court, which is 40 miles to the west of London. Um, inside that court, uh, in the court office, there used to be uh, cupboards full of files, just like this. These desks here used to be buried under piles of paper. There were trolleys to carry files around the building. Now they're parked, unwanted and unloved. Now why is that? Well, let's go into the courtroom. This is a view from the jury box. You can see that uh, jurors are still given access to pencil and paper, Bible to take the oath, uh, and so on. But just facing them across the courtroom is a large screen, a television screen. Um, to be honest, if you're sitting here in the jury box, that television screen isn't quite close enough, but you know, it's, it's, it's a start. Now, on the screen at the moment is uh, an advertisement for a visual display service called ClickShare. Let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, the idea is that any lawyer sitting in court with their own laptop can send images from the laptop to the screen. So there you are, you see somebody demonstrating. He's got his laptop, and whatever's on his laptop is on the screen. You can't see because we've obscured it to protect the innocent. Um, but the idea is that anybody can see what's going on. How does it work? Well, just look here at this little dongle. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, all you need is one of those. You plug it into your computer. You, tick, you pick one up from the, uh, the desk by the, where the judge sits. Uh, when you come into court, you plug it into your computer like that. You press the big gray button, and then everything that's on your uh, laptop is displayed uh, for everybody in court to see. And it's not just documents. You can connect a DVD player to your laptop, and you can play videos. Now, it doesn't sound very exciting, but until recently, if you went into a court, you would find everybody scrabbling to find compatible hardware to play whatever uh, uh, videos or other uh, evidence the police or the prosecution service might bring to court. It doesn't sound exactly rocket science, but it was quite difficult. I was in the court martial appeal court uh, the other day, quite an obscure court to be in, but it was in the Lord Chief Justice's court in the Royal Courts of Justice in the Strand, and uh, it was necessary to play crucial video evidence of a soldier shooting a man on the ground in Afghanistan. And there was a pregnant pause while we waited for the court associate to work out how to get the output from the video player on his desk onto the screens in the court. I mean, he got there, but it was not terribly satisfactory. OK, now what are we looking at now? This, is, um, uh, this disc contains footage of a car chase by the police. I've actually obscured the defendant's name, although there's nothing particularly confidential about it. 
Um, if you look closely, you see it says, this disk may contain distressing images. So I suppose you all want to see what's on it, don't you? Um, it was certainly distressing um, for the defendant. Now, um, this is, uh, what you're looking at now is the prosecutor finding the DVD drive on her laptop while my iPhone is struggling to focus on the TV screen. But in a moment, you will see police officers chasing a suspect vehicle. This is the view from the police patrol. The officers are going along and then they get a message to follow a black car. Now, in a moment, you'll see two black cars they overtake here, and you'll see two black cars coming across the screen. There they are. Now, you want to look at the first of the two black cars. Uh, that one stops, um, and the, uh, uh, the police are overtaking. Uh, 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 right, and he's chasing. Do you see that wing mirror? He's about to he smash the wing mirror. Now, watch very carefully, because in real life, of course, he doesn't get much further down the road in Reading before he hits a, car, uh, a, 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 a traffic jam. Out jumps the uh, suspect, and that's the end of the video. So there you have... Um, the sort of evidence which is now played in court um, using this sort of technology. Now, I know what you're thinking. Uh, what happens if the prosecutor is operating her or his laptop and plays the wrong video by mistake? Holiday snaps or something worse appears on the screen. Fortunately, the judge has this big red button <laughs> and can stop the display at any time. Okay. Now, this is part of what's called the Crown Court Digital Case System. It's available in all Crown Courts, and authorised users can access it using any kind of computer, a PC, a Mac, whatever they've got, iPhone, iPad. Um, and material can be uploaded to this system by everybody who is involved in the case. So the judges, court officials, prosecutors, and defence lawyers. Now, again, it may not strike those of you who are familiar with computers in other walks of life as, pretty, uh, as uh, anything remarkable, but by the standards of the courts of England and Wales, um, this is pretty revolutionary stuff. The crucial point is that by uploading material to this system, you no longer need paper files. And by last June, um, the equivalent of six million pages of evidence had been stored on this Crown Court digital case system. If these pages had been piled up, they would have reached the height of the Shard, which is London's tallest building. But that was last summer. Now, the pile would be the height of the tallest building in the world. It doesn't look very tall in this poster, which I saw on the wall of the Ministry of Justice, but let me show you the view looking down from the top, or nearly of the top of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, and you look down on the skyscrapers below. Now, I hope you're impressed with the degree of personal research that I've done for this particular lecture. Fortunately, I'm not actually standing on a pile of documents at this stage as I, as I pose for the inevitable selfie. Okay, back to the digital case system. Now, this is what a defence advocate might see. Uh, here is the form. Uh, we've obscured a little bit of the information. Um, and as I say, some parts of the, uh, of the uh, system are private and can be accessed only by judges and court staff. I was in Cardiff Crown Court yesterday talking to the, uh, uh, the, the, the senior judge uh, there uh, and she said to me um, that uh, it's all working terribly well. Um, people sound a bit surprised at this, and, and as I say, if you listen to what some of the lawyers have been saying, that this will never work and all government-inspired computer projects are bound to fail, well, you know, uh, people are surprised that this is actually working and is saving time and saving effort. And judges can now take their laptops home with them, Lawyers can access all this information online. Uh, it's secure. It hasn't been hacked into. Um, it's actually working. It's extraordinary. And this digital case system also connects to a separate system used by the Crown Prosecution Service. This is their interface. Um, you can see, if you look closely, it says indictment, basis of plea, charges, case summary, key witness statements, key exhibits, witness statements, exhibits, transcripts. Uh, streamlined forensic reports, expert reports, trial documents, jury bundle, so it's a lot there. And um, 
here's another page of it. Um, the, uh, the name that's obscured at the top of the page uh, is the defending barrister. Um, uh, the court service asked for the name to be taken out, but he's actually called John Simmons. Um, you, can see, um, you can see that his client, his client uh, pleaded not guilty at an earlier hearing. The plea was taken uh, uh, by a court official and registered on the case file. Um, his name's been obscured. And uh, you just have to sort of grasp the, the significance of this. A court file, which used to be one of these piles of bundles of paper, uh, which you saw at the beginning of the, of the presentation, um, is a physical thing that can be read only by one person at one time in one place. This court file can be read by any of the people involved in the case at any time. It really is an extraordinary improvement. Now, I mentioned John Simmons, the defence lawyer in this particular case. Uh, he's a barrister. He's actually employed full-time by a solicitor's firm, but he's something of a traditionalist. He likes making handwritten notes using different colours for headings. Again, we've obscured the actual notes for reasons of client confidentiality, but you can just about see, I think, the, the heading um, there. Um, possible cross-examination, XX, cross-examination to consider, and um, instructions needed from the client. So that's the sort of notes that any barrister will say, will make. But these notes weren't made on paper. Um, if you look, you can see that Mr. Simmons uses an Apple pencil on his iPad Pro and he uses this to create something that looks very much like um, the barrister's notebook that, that counsel are so fond of. And when the case is over, again, I've obscured this so you can't see it very clearly, but you'll have to take my word for it. That, that is, um, an, uh, that, that, that's meant to look like a barrister's notebook with you know, the name of the client there and um, information about the case and so on. And what he's done is he's saved this whole document with his handwritten notes on the digital case file for this particular defendant. So it's there permanently, it can't get lost. If there's an appeal, a miscarriage of justice, 10, 20, 30 years in the future, it can be retrieved. Um, and it's just a very efficient way of storing information. Of course, these courtroom screens can be used to display photographs, diagrams, just the sort of evidence that used to be printed up um, for the jury and given to them in large folders to take away in the jury room. And one of the things that judges are working out at the moment is how you uh, allow uh, the jury access to the electronic material um, that they probably need to take with. They don't have to take all the uh, evidence in, but they may want to look at the crucial video again and how do you play that to them in their jury room when nobody can go in and talk to them, what sort of laptop do you give them, what sort of facilities. All this is under consideration. Um, the screens in court are very important as well because... Um, vulnerable witnesses can give evidence through video links. Um, what this is showing you is an anonymous building. Um, it's a council office in a, a part of England, but it's nowhere near the courts. Um, and you know, a vulnerable witness can go in through the back door, go up to a suite. Actually, it's the same place where people go um, after rape attacks and so on. They're, they talk, they're, they're, they speak to doctors, they speak to police and so on. And they sit there, and um, uh, there is um, obviously a video link to the court. You can see the camera there, um, and that tiny image in the corner of the picture um, it would show the courtroom uh, that she can see, and of course this is um, the person here and so on, and that's me taking the photograph behind her. Um, and and uh, video links are increasingly important. Um, they're not exactly second-class prisoners, they actually prefer... Um, appearing in court on video links these days because once you, if you're a prisoner and you're taken to court, uh, once you're brought back at the end of the day, you find your cell's been taken by somebody else or maybe even you go, go back to a completely different prison. So, you know, they prefer it. Um, and here's some very simple technology. This is a speaker phone on the judge's bench at Reading Crown Court. It allows judges to have preliminary hearings uh, with the lawyers instead of requiring them to come to court. Now, again, it doesn't seem very revolutionary, does it? But it makes a great deal of difference because it means that the judge can have a telephone conference call to the senior lawyers involved in the actual case, maybe a month before the hearing. Those barristers usually are involved in another case, in another court, another part of the country. Um, and if the judge had said, I want you to come here, well, the lawyers would have said, I'm too busy, I'm doing another case, I can't come. But if the judge says, well, I want a conference call at half past nine in the morning, maybe an hour before your other court sits, and they're on the phone, on their mobiles, from the robing room in another court, 
uh, the judge can actually get uh, to speak to the lawyers who are actually going to handle the case, and a lot can be sorted out in advance. Um, the judge I was speaking to in Cardiff yesterday said to me, it's absolutely crucial to sort all the contentious things out in advance uh, so that the start of the de uh, trial is not delayed. Um, uh, this, uh, I saw this operating, and it's rather curious. The, I don't think the barristers quite realise that they, their call was in open court, and they, you know, they address the, the judge as judge, which is what you do informally rather than... Um, uh, Your Honour, uh, but, but um, it, it's all public and it, and it all makes a great deal of difference. Now, technology like this has been a long time in coming. When Lord Wolfe was Lord Chief Justice from 2000, and, 2000 to 2005, he wanted to bring in some technology of this sort. He asked court officials to start putting IT in the civil courts as part of his civil justice reforms. Um, and um, I haven't spoken to Lord Wolfe about this, but his successor as Lord Chief Justice recalled what happened. They set about wiring the Royal Courts of Justice and other courts at enormous expense. They didn't have the money to complete it, and the wiring is now completely redundant, as everything is Wi-Fi. That wasn't really the wiring, but it gives you an idea. And the reason that this was such a mistake, and the reason that I'm hoping that the reforms I'm talking to you about tonight are going to work, is a pretty fundamental and straightforward one. Big computer projects fail when designers and programmers are too remote from their customers. For these systems to work, the people who build these projects must understand the needs of the people who will use them. Users must approve every stage in the development of the project. And one reason why the IT uh, schemes failed so badly at the turn of the century was that the judges had no effective voice in running the courts in which they sat. The courts were effectively run by the Lord Chancellor rather than by the judges. The judges were the people who needed to use the technology, but nobody actually thought to ask them what they needed. I suppose it was thought at the time they weren't capable of making decisions of that sort. It may have been true. But nobody actually asked them what they wanted, and that was the problem. Now, um, there were dramatic changes. Lord Wolfe delayed his retirement because uh, there were radical changes um, in the relationship between the uh, executive and the judiciary. Um, these started in 2003 when Lord Irvin of Legge was sacked by Tony Blair after serving as Lord Chancellor for six years. Uh, and Lord Wolfe stayed to see those reforms through. Then he retired and then we had a new Act of Parliament called the Constitutional Reform Act 2005. And that was crucial to this because for the first time, senior judges became responsible for the administration of their own courts. Until then, the Lord Chancellor had been head of the judiciary. The Lord Chancellor is primarily a government minister. Uh, now the Lord Chief Justice is head of the judiciary and the Lord Chief Justice is primarily a judge. And that fundamental change paved the way for the reforms I'm going to be talking about tonight. At the same time, um, there was academic thought given to how to reform the courts. A great deal of the work has been done by Professor Richard Soskind, who is uh, a former Gresham professor. He's here in the audience tonight. I'm very honored to see him. He has uh, done a great deal of the thinking behind all of this. Um, and uh, it provided the intellectual heft and a great deal of the advice on what I'm about to tell you about. So 2005 was the year in which, the power, in which power shifted from the government to the judges. And at the same time, a new body called Her Majesty's Court Service was set up by the government to run the civil and criminal <coughs> courts of England and Wales. In 2011, uh, uh, tribunals were added to, uh, be, and the uh, body was renamed Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunals Service, or HMCTS. Tribunals, as I'm sure you know, are informal courts, but until then they had actually been run mainly by the government departments that, uh, they, whose work they actually judged, which wasn't very satisfactory. They're now part of the court's service, 
and one of the aspects of the reform is, I think, an increasing level of integration between the traditional courts and the less formal uh, tribunals. Uh, now, under the terms of its uh, service document, Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunals Service operates on the basis of a partnership between the Lord Chancellor and the Lord Chief Justice. So in that way, the judges have a major say in these reforms. They're represented on the board of HMCTS. For much of last year, HMCTS had to operate without proper leadership after the previous chief executive suddenly walked out for reasons that have never been explained. But Susan Ackland Hood took over at the end of November. She is answerable to a board, and as I say, that has three serving judges. It has an independent chair. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that uh, she started extremely well. Uh, she has her own Twitter account. She's much more aware of the need uh, for public accountability. And um, it's even the case, radical um, though this may sound, that she's prepared just occasionally and under strict conditions to talk to journalists. Um, but I don't want you to think that um, her arrival was, was year zero for court reform. Uh, some improvements had been introduced a few years earlier. Uh, this is ELIS, uh, which stands for Electronic Library and Information Services, and it allows judges online access to legal texts and precedents. And now there's e-judiciary, which gives judges access to secure email and other services. Um, these include document storage, the judicial intranet for job advertisements and for announcements, which then get leaked to the press, like an 11% pay rise for high court judges, uh, which uh, uh, was put on the internet yesterday and leaked today. Um, job adverts, other news, um, the, judicial, the Judicial College for training and guidance, access to BBC News so they can see how well their sentencing decisions have gone down. Um, it's all done by Microsoft. It's pretty straightforward. And crucially, judges and magistrates can access this service from any sort of computer at home or wherever um, they have. Uh, and um, again, that's what we all do. But um, until now, and, and some people in the court service or the judiciary still have this, um, you can only access this on dedicated terminals, which took 20 minutes to boot up and several passwords and were running old fashioned software and so on. So accessing this sort of information from a laptop makes it much quicker and easier for judges to work. But you know, you're, you're, here we are, 20 minutes into this lecture, and you're saying, you know, tell me something new. Um, electronic libraries and document processing merely replicates functions that were performed more slowly and expensively before computers were developed. As one leading judge said, a word processor is really little more than an electronic version of the printing press invented all those centuries ago in Renaissance Italy. So the challenge for the courts now is to use information technology to do things that only information technology can do. And that's what's being done in the HMCTS reform program. Judges insist that to serve the needs of a 21st century society, the justice system must be digital by default and by design. But there's still a long way to go. This is the Central Family Court in London. Last month, the president of the family division, Sir James Munby, commented on the technology in the courts he is responsible for. And uh, this is what he said. The video links in too many family courts are a disgrace, prone to the link failing and with desperately poor sound and picture quality. The Royal Courts of Justice in London, he said, surely the flagship is a case in point. And he went on, my own court has no video link. On a recent occasion, when, having moved to another court in the Royal Courts of Justice, I used a video link, everyone and everything appeared on the screen in such a bright, bright blue shade as to remind me of Avatar. That's a film made in 2009, members of the jury. Um, on another recent occasion, everything on screen appeared bathed in that green translucent glow one associates with underwater photography. Sir James said that this had happened at a preliminary hearing and it could go ahead despite the problem because uh, it didn't really matter too much, but it would be much more difficult if the court had been hearing evidence. The problem, according to Sir James Munby, is one of resources, and he says responsibility for that lies with the courts and tribunal service and ultimately with ministers. In his view, much more needs to be done to match the facilities available in the Crown Court. 
And this is the Crown Court. It's a typical modern courtroom viewed from one end of the judge's bench. This is where the judge sits. Uh, the dock is just, there it is. No, that's the dock, glass dock, with um, holes in the glass so you can pass notes through to your client. Um, witness box, top right there, that's where the witness stands. Uh, the judge has two computer screens on each side on these special arms, which we lowered so the judge can actually see what's going on in court. This particular judge said she insisted on this, uh, very hands-on. Um, crucially, this is her laptop, which she brings in from her room adjoining the court and takes home with her and has all the information on it that she needs. Still a few bits of paper, printed books and so on, um, but nevertheless, um, this is a, a pretty impressive court. This particular person is from the Crown Prosecution Service. She's using her laptop. Um, there'd be more people in court if it was in session. Obviously, it's not in session. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have been allowed to photograph it. And if you had seen it at work, you would have seen more lawyers and more laptops. Um, I saw uh, one yesterday, uh, a lawyer who had a laptop on a lectern so that the, you know, he could see it at the right height. But strip out the technology, and this court isn't so different from how it would have looked in the 19th century. Um, a trial by jury now isn't that different from how it was in the 19th century. There have been quite a lot of reforms introduced by Sir Brian Leveson. Uh, the judges are now much more uh, helpful to the jury. They tell the jurors what legal issues are, maybe before the summing up, so they understand what they've got to understand and so on. But as I say, if these computers in court were all I really wanted to tell you about, I wouldn't have troubled to invite you here tonight. HMCTS reform goes much further than digitizing a crown court like this, the criminal courts. The reforms I'm talking about are going to apply to all courts in England and Wales. That's criminal, civil, family, and the tribunals. And they are very, very important. These are described um, as the most radical reforms since 1873 by the Lord Chief Justice, Lord Thomas of Coombe And he explained that the reform has three main elements. Digitization and the use of information technology for all procedures and hearings. Simplification of processes uh, and procedures, so there's uniform common procedural regime for civil, family, tribunals, justice, and for crime. And modernization of the court estate, that means buildings, so that they're used jointly by courts and tribunals more efficiently. They're fit for purpose, and they support new ways of working. And this whole thing was summed up even more simply by Sir Ernest Ryder, who is the senior judge in charge of tribunals. He said that the aim that had been agreed between him and the Lord Chief Justice was quite simply to strengthen the rule of law. Well, how soon might we see this? Actually, much sooner than you might think, because by the year 2022, it's said by the people who are running this that most civil disputes in England and Wales will be resolved through an online court. Now, what is that? Well, an online court won't look anything like this. In fact, it won't look like anything at all. It will live in what we call the cloud, which means the information that is created and is stored, uh, the processes is going to be stored on computer servers that could be anywhere in the country. And when you free the courts from the constraints of storing and transmitting and communicating information on paper, you liberate the court from the courtroom. Courts will be able to sit anywhere. In fact, they won't actually sit at all, because once you have the technology right, the very idea of having all the parties and the judge and the witnesses in the same room at the same time will seem very 20th century. One aim, particularly in tribunals, is to have what's called an iterative process. It's also described as online continuous hearings. I'll tell you how it's going to work. The person who's bringing a case sends in a claim. The claim comes up on the judge's computer. The judge can be anywhere in the world. The judge reads the claim and uh, writes to the other side. The defendant sends the defendant some questions. 
Um, the defendant answers the question, sends in the answers, and the judge sends those answers back to the claimant and asks the claimant some questions. This is all taking place iteratively over a period of time. Uh, the defendant has a chance to respond and, and so on and so on and so on. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, is actually going to start in one particular tribunal um, this autumn. Um, and it will be extended because the crucial thing to understand about how this whole system of courts reform is being done is that it's being done bit by bit by bit. Everything is tried, everything is tested, and then they go on to the next bit. Well, setting up a system like this costs money. Where is that money going to come from? The first clue was this letter uh, to court staff signed jointly by Chris Grayling, who was Secretary of State at the Ministry of Justice, and Lord Thomas, the Lord Chief Justice. That was in March 2014, uh, nearly three years ago. Their letter promised an investment averaging £75 million per annum over five years from 2015-2016, front-loaded to maximise impact. Well, that adds up to 375 million. Um, sounds a lot, but it turned out to be quite a, a, a modest figure, um, especially as Mr Grayling was promising that it would generate savings of 100 million pounds a year. Well, that was then, March 2014. Um, by the time um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer published his autumn statement in November of the following year, the figure of 375 million had been rounded up to 380 million, and then it had been doubled, nearly doubled, to more than 700 million, uh, with expected savings of nearly twice as much as before, approximately 200 million pounds a year. And then, by the time the Lord Chief Justice published his annual report for 2015, which was a couple of months after the Chancellor's autumn statement, we had the final figures and the investment had become £738 million over five years, which mysteriously was extended to seven years without any particular announcement, and an additional £270 million uh, for the criminal courts took the total to more than £1 billion. Well, fine, but there was a price to pay. In February 2016, the Ministry of Justice announced plans to close 86 courts and tribunals. After protests around the country, a further five courts identified in a consultation paper a few months earlier were reprieved. Ministers hoped that asset sales would fund 40% of the 738 million allocated by the Treasury, uh, but it's not entirely clear that they will be quite as successful in selling off the courts as they had hoped. So what will replace the magistrates' courts? This is a rather fine picture showing the scene outside Bow Street Court in London, actually more than a century ago. It was 1913. You can see it was at the height of the suffragette disturbances. And it's fascinating, really. The, the, apart from the fact that the stone is cleaner, it still looks pretty much the same uh, as it does today, except um, if you look really closely, it says police court there, and it now um, says magistrates' court. And also, if you over here, there are phone boxes, which I suppose were introduced in the 1930s. But Bow Street Court closed for business um, a decade or so ago, like so many other magistrates' courts in London. The next to go will be Hammersmith and Camberwell Green. Um, there are plans to sell off Bow Street and the police station next door to turn it into a hotel. Nothing much has happened. Um, so what will happen to it? Uh, is the court going to become a hotel? Or is it maybe going to become a computer? Because... Earlier this month, the government announced it would be piloting a scheme under which defendants charged with low-level criminal offences could plead guilty online instead of going to a court like this, and they would be sentenced and punished there and then. It's referred to as automatic <coughs> online conviction. To begin with, it'll apply only to people aged 18 or over who plead guilty to certain minor offences. It'll apply only to defendants who offer no mitigating circumstances for a court to consider. And it'll apply only to defendants who choose to take part in the scheme and agree to pay the standard penalty that they're offered when they log on to the system. Now, as I said, it applies only to minor offences. Uh, these are what are called summary offences, ones that can be tried only by magistrates. They're not offences for which you can be sent to prison. 
and uh, they have to be listed in a ministerial order uh, that has to be laid down before Parliament. So, as I say, they're starting small, and they're starting with three offences, um, and that this is going to be a, a trial of these offences. Um, which offences are they? Well, the first is failure to produce a railway ticket. The next is tram fare evasion. And the third is possessing an unlicensed fishing rod with intent. Um, I think that these were chosen, and by the way, I'm not sure this is absolutely right, because the, um, the, the announcement by the government didn't quite specify the offences in the sort of detail that you've got here. Um, but you can see a certain logic to them, because the maximum penalty for the first one is £500, maximum for the second is 1000 and the maximum for the third is 2500 uh, But none of them are imprisonable. Um, I thought there really ought to be a cooling off period. I thought that, you know, you should have a, uh, the opportunity, you know, like pulling out about higher purchase agreement, you come home drunk, you find a summons uh, by email, you, you, you click on it, you say, oh, terrible, and you plead guilty and you pay the fine, and the next morning you think, hang on, do I really want a criminal record? Um, I think defendants should have a week to change their minds uh, without, uh, um, uh, without losing out. But I'm afraid to say I don't think that suggestion has been taken up by the government. But the Ministry of Justice has promised that courts will have the power to set aside a conviction and start proceedings again if it can be shown that the defendant didn't understand the consequences of pleading guilty. Uh, critics of this have said, well, this is going to allow people to accept convictions without the embarrassment of going to court. But I have to say, this is the sort of thing for which you can now plead guilty by post at the moment. Um, that may change if the scheme really takes off and it may apply to other uh, cases. Now, so far I've been talking about the criminal courts. Um, let's move on to the civil courts, the, the ones that decide disputes between uh, organisations. I found this rather good picture of Sir Michael Briggs, who uh, it must have been taken, I think, four or five years ago when he was Vice-Chancellor of the County Palatine of Lancaster, hence the red roses on his robes. Um, in July 2015, he was asked by the Lord Chief Justice to review the civil courts in England and Wales. In December of that year, he published his interim report, and last summer he published his final recommendations. Um, and the report was a very impressive piece of work. It's well worth reading um, if you're interested in this sort of thing. But let me, let me tell you about one or two of the things he said. He said that the civil courts in England and Wales are among the most highly regarded in the world. The judicial incorruptibility of the judges is beyond question. The judges invariably write or speak their own judgments rather than leaving their drafting to their assistants, as happens in the United States. And their ability to deliver off-the-cuff judgments means that, to a much greater extent than in most of Europe, court users generally receive their decisions quickly. Well, those are their strengths, but Sir Michael continued, the single most pervasive and intractable weakness of our civil courts is that they simply don't provide reasonable access to justice for any but the most wealthy individuals. And for that tiny minority still in receipt of legal aid, and for those mainly with personal injury claims who can obtain no win, no fee agreements with their lawyers, although that too is under some threat at the moment, and for the few who get free advice and representation, and of course for large organisations, substantial business entities. His criticism of the current system is that the courts were designed by lawyers for use by lawyers. And he said, for the first time, we have an opportunity to design from scratch and build from its foundations a wholly new court. Its purpose is to enable individuals and small businesses to vindicate their civil rights in a range of small and moderate cases without recourse to lawyers or with such minimal recourse that their services can be sensibly afforded. Now, what are we going to do to enable this to happen? Well, we're going to have something that may be called her Majesty's Online Court. That title hasn't quite been decided yet. There are various arguments over what it will be called. And uh, when we get the bill tomorrow, you'll find it doesn't actually say what the court is going to be called. That's to be decided. But if its recommendations, if Michael Briggs's recommendations are accepted, this will work in three stages. 
Stage one of the process will be helping court users to explain their claim or defence clearly enough for it to be understood by their opponent and, if necessary, resolved by the court. Stage two will involve a mix of conciliation and case management, conducted partly online and partly by telephone, although probably not face-to-face. And this will probably be done by a case officer, perhaps going to be called a case lawyer. This will be somebody who's legally qualified, an official who's trained and supervised by the judiciary. Stage three is a judgment, maybe after a hearing. The court may have enough information to decide the case without a hearing, uh, but if it is a a hearing, it'll probably be on the phone or Skype or something like that. If there is a face-to-face hearing, it'll be within strict time limits. Let's just go through that in a little bit more detail. Stage one is the most ambitious of all, helping court users to outline their claim or defence. And for that reason, um, ironically, uh, paradoxically, it'll probably be introduced last after stages two and three. But this whole idea of stage one takes advantage of new technology. Indeed, it couldn't really work without it. So how will it work? Well, Lord Justice Briggs didn't go into a lot of detail, so these are my own predictions. Since I wrote this particular aspect, I've discovered that it's not so far from the, uh, the reality. You'd probably start on a government website. This is a real one already operating, and you can use it to plead guilty or not guilty to a traffic offence. That's the address in case you ever need it. Um, And uh, it's interesting, there's already something similar being tried out for divorce petitions. I don't think it's live online, but it's being tested. At the moment, uh, it's in very early stages, you need to print out a form and send it in by post, but that will change. They use this to help them develop it. Um, it's quite an extraordinary form. You tick boxes, A for adultery, B for behaviour, C for... So, I mean, I kid you not, that's what you do. Um, and you then send on the, uh, the, 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 the fee online. But um, um, I, as far as I can see, before too long, you won't actually need a computer to use the online court. There's bound to be an app for it, and I suppose this will be the first court that you can actually visit on your smartphone. Now, at the heart of this court is something called a decision tree. You may know what this is. If you're just the user, you don't need to worry about it. For you, it's just a series of questions. You fill in your name and address, um, I speculate, and then the first question the computer might ask you is, who's complaining? Who is bringing the case? If it's you, you click me. If somebody else is complaining about you, you click someone else. If it's you, then the app will ask you, what are you complaining about? Maybe a product that you ordered online hasn't arrived. Maybe it arrived, but it was faulty and it stopped working. If someone else is complaining about you, the app will want to know why. Maybe it's the electricity company saying you haven't paid the bill. In that case, it'll ask you if you have paid it. If so, when? Can you prove it? If not, why not? And so on. I saw the uh, real thing displayed uh, at an event last week that uh, Richard Suskin was speaking at. Um, And the actual thing that's being tested says on page one, we need to know if you're the person owed money or if you're making the claim on behalf of someone else. And there are two tick boxes, radio buttons, you have the choice, I'm making the claim for myself or I'm a legal representative. Next screen, do you want to claim interest? 8%, different rate, don't claim interest. Are you claiming against a company? Fill in the postcode, fill in the email address, check your claim, pay the fee, here are the details, um, and then um, sign a statement of truth. All this online. As I say, that's the, it's in alpha testing at the moment, not yet available, but that's what they're working on. Um, let's assume that you're the person who is complaining, and uh, let's imagine it's about a faulty device which has stopped working. The app will want to know where you got it. Did you buy it online? Did you buy it in a shop? If you bought it online, did the website email you a receipt? Uh, Have you kept the receipt? Um, If so, send it in to a unique address. If you uh, don't have the receipt, can you remember which website it was? What was the web address? The software will help you find it. If you bought it in a shop, um, can you upload the receipt on your smartphone? And then, In due course, the court will get in touch with the defendant. Again, I suppose by email. Did you sell this item to this person? 
If you did, and you're willing to settle the claim, will you refund the full cost? Will you replace the faulty item? If you sold it and you say there was nothing wrong with it, do you want the claimant to prove it? Again, I saw uh, an example of of the real thing, and uh, it asked whether you wanted to um, suggest a solution, to go to mediation, or continue to a hearing. But at the end of this process, what it's doing is it's capturing information that used to be gathered by lawyers, and it's getting together the sort of information um, for the judge, um, which used to take lawyers a great deal of information to discover. So what you'd get for a new claim is you would get a document that says it's a claim for breach of contract, it would have the claimant's name and address, it would say the court fee has been paid, it would say the defendant is a shop, it would provide the address of the defendant, it would provide um, an allegation that the product was faulty, it would say it stopped working, um, and it would say a replacement is offered. I mean, this is the sort of thing which a lawyer uh, would actually uh, obtain. And, of course, there would be the evidence. The receipt would be uploaded, and there it is. So um, it's important to understand that the claimant who's bringing this case, probably without a lawyer, doesn't need to know any law, doesn't need to know whether this claim is being brought in contract or in tort. That's something the software works out for itself. So stage two, as I say, involves a mix of conciliation and case management to try and settle the case. It's carried out by a case officer or a case lawyer. Most case officers will be legally trained, but there will always be a right to have your decisions reconsidered by a judge. And as I say, stage three is the judgment. The court may have enough information to decide the case without a hearing, but the judge could order a telephone conference call or it could even be a face-to-face hearing, as I say. Now, where does this leave the lawyers? Three years ago, barristers walked out in protest against the planned cuts in legal aid. This is a protest. Are we going to see more protests like this? The underlying problem, as we heard earlier from Lord Justice Briggs, is that going to court is too expensive for just about everybody in this room. Unless you're a corporation, you can't afford to go to court. Well, that's difficult, and the government's first solution was to cut public funding, to cut legal aid. But, of course, that's a very bad idea because it always, always increases costs in other parts of the system. And you must have some sort of legal aid for defendants charged with criminal offences. So cutting legal aid isn't going to work. But the problem remains, going to court is just too expensive. So the online court is designed to be used without lawyers. But that in itself causes other problems because you don't know when you should fight a case or when you should settle if you're not a lawyer and you have, or you don't have advice from a lawyer. And so the answer from Briggs is to build in an opportunity for claimants and defendants to take independent legal advice at the start of the case, even if somebody else has to pay for it. Another problem, of course, is that some people can't use computers or smartphones, although an awful lot of them have access to somebody who can help them, you know, usually a grandchild. Um, These are people uh, referred to as digitally excluded, and they can be helped. They can be helped by court staff, uh, the people who have no longer got jobs filing papers. But this is a very big and ambitious project. Nothing on this scale has been attempted anywhere in the world. And that's why they're starting with a series of private, they're starting with a series of pilot projects restricted to simple claims like money claims, and they're building it up bit by bit. There are huge advantages in this. The online court will enable more people to get access to justice, unless, of course, the government turns out to be greedy and increases the court fees to such a level that people can't afford it. But you can see why barristers are worried about the future. This is the elected chairman of the bar this year, Andrew Langdon. Two months ago, he said justice has a human face and it's not a face on a screen. He said that the value of traditional human, physical, real face-to-face contact by the delivery of justice by one of Her Majesty's judges, seated, one hopes, not in a pop-up or a mobile court, but in a place where the majesty of the law is still discernible, is what you really want. But I'm not sure, and I'm sure that the government says this, and even the judges accept it, I'm not sure that we can actually afford the majesty of the law anymore. 
So what is the government doing? Well, it has a bill coming out tomorrow, as I told you. It's not actually going to be called that. That was the previous title. It's going to be called the Prisons and Courts Bill. And the way in which it's going to facilitate the online court is it's going to create what's called an online procedure rules committee, which will decide how the online court will work, set the rules for it, and indeed what it's going to be called. But this bill is um, a very significant bill. It will, in the government's view, make access to the courts swifter, more accessible, easier to use, more virtual hearings, allowing victims to take part without uh, running the risk of coming face-to-face -face with their assailant, that's criminal cases, um, bail applications resolved by video or telephone conferencing, allowing justice to be delivered more swiftly, um, the online um, magistrates' courts that I told you about, allowing people to plead guilty, accept a conviction, and be issued a penalty and pay the penalty there and then. Uh, businesses should be able to recover uh, money more easily using the online court. Uh, and um, it's uh, uh, an ambitious um, plan which has to be supported by legislation. Judges and magistrates will no longer find themselves tied up doing routine tasks that can be completed by court staff. More flexibility to allow cases in the Crown Court to be moved back to the magistrates' court if the case turns out to be less serious than is thought. More flexible deployment of judges, all that sort of thing. So that's, that's in the bill to be published tomorrow. And it's a, few, uh, it's a huge and ambitious thing. And that, I'm afraid, is it. The next lecture, you can put in your diaries now, <laughs> next February. This is me. If you want to read more, you can buy my book online about the online court. And back to Valerie, who's going to tell you what happens next.